Welcome to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Hey everyone, happy Friday. Welcome to Analysis and Chains. As always, I'm Nathan and with me is Neil. How are you doing today, Neil? I'm doing uh, fantastic, Nathan. It's uh, interesting times. The sky is falling for a lot of people this week uh, with Bitcoin price crashing. That's true. That's true. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and the factors that are involved with it. We've also got a special segment that we're going to run at the end of the episode. I recorded a series of special segments uh, a little while ago uh, when I was researching different applications for blockchain, different aspects of blockchain, technical things that I found interesting that I wanted to learn about. And so I wanted to share that a bit with you. And I... But first, uh, let's uh, talk about our news. Um, I mean, there's not that much new news, but uh, we do still uh, accept emails and voting for the name of our Analysis in Chains bot. So we've got Bit the Bot, Bot in Chains, and Body McBotface. And so by all means, write into info at analysisinchains.com and we'll give you some free Neil and Nathan nutshells. So... um, yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> do that. Yeah, please. Do it. E- email into us. It's not as if we're staring at the inbox all day long, waiting for your emails to come in. I kind of am. <laughs> you know? I, I love getting. Uh, I love getting emails. So, uh, and speaking of connecting, uh, I'll be in San Francisco. I mentioned this last episode uh, at the beginning of October. If you're interested in helping me organize a, a, a meetup or inviting me to a meetup, I would love to meet people involved in the crypto scene in San Francisco. So. Uh, again, info uh, at analysisandchains.com. Right. Uh, oh, and don't forget, if you want some Neil and Nathan nutshells, they're our uh, engagement factor, our reward for listening to us. They are our official uh, crypto token available on the Waves platform. If you want some, write in as well. All right. Yeah. Let's yeah, get I, to I'm, the... I'm curious how many people want nutshells when uh, all cryptocurrencies are crashing. Now, I think it won't Clearly. be long... We are the inverse value. As Bitcoin drops, nutshells rise up in in value. Potentially, potentially. Well, or we, you could say it won't be long until Bitcoin is the same value as nutshells. <laughs> you well, could that's say sort of that. the, the, the <laughs> pessimistic way of looking at it. The way I like to think of it, Neil, is that because the Neil and Nathan nutshells are based on the value of talking about uh, uh, the value of cryptocurrency, the value of us talking on analysis and chains. Clearly, the the more interesting news, either bad or good for cryptocurrency prices, the more value is in our nutshells. Well, you you could be onto something there. Maybe this is a business model that would take off in 100 years' time when we all live off uh, cryptocurrencies. So yeah, you know, stick at it. You know, <laughs> maybe we'll uh, work out eventually. Quite you. All right. So, <laughs> okay. So sky is falling, Neil. What's going on? Yeah. Well, um, as uh, as I was saying for a while, I did feel like there was a lot of speculation and over excitement baked into the Bitcoin price, and for many cryptocurrencies as well. And so it is only natural that there is. A big pullback. Um, now, in this case, the, the big pullback was triggered by various factors, but uh, I think the primary one is really the Chinese government reaction. Uh, you know, we saw that with a few regulations that were introduced um, in terms of tr- um, trading Bitcoin, and now the exchanges are being forced. And you know, it's only natural that we have such an extreme reaction because Bitcoin went up way too quickly so if something goes up way too quickly based on hype well then uh, a bit of fear is naturally going to bring it down just as quick i don't know <laughs> i mean i guess so you're i mean you're you're totally right neil um and i don't think that anyone was under the illusion well i hope there was no one that was under the illusion <laughs> that uh, there was uh, that speculation didn't play a huge role in the price of bitcoin i mean you know, I mean, we, you and I have had talks about uh, about what the speculative value versus the real value is, but um, and that's a subject for debate of how much is speculative and how much isn't. Um, and I don't think hype is a bad thing. I think hype is a, a very important thing. But but the question is what levels they're at 
uh, not whether it's there. Everyone knows that uh, that this is a big hype and a big uh, inflationary bubble with people getting excited. So, but it, it's interesting looking at what the different factors are in that make up that uh, that hype and that speculation. Because I mean, if we could figure that out, we'd be rich men, wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, the thing about I guess this Bitcoin bubble and that was made it so different. I think is really down to ICOs and the ICO boom, um, which really has taken off largely thanks to Ethereum. And because we kept hearing in the news about an ICO going for X million dollars and the next one was even more than the last one, naturally it just brings a lot of people into the crypto space. And so everyone's more intrigued. And then you know, with that, they saw the Bitcoin price go up and other prices go up. So naturally, they wanted a piece of the action. And so you have this kind of like snowball effect, which is totally normal, like no different to the Bitcoin uh, bubble. Uh, sorry, no different to the dot-com bubble back in the late 1990s. So like, it's totally normal. Now, um, for it to, to go down so violently, yes, this was expected. But I think you kind of have to look at the the bigger picture in play here, which is... Um, I don't think it's going to go below what it was at the start of the year. You know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are gaining momentum in the more bigger picture, longer term approach. And also, you have to think of the awareness that all of this has brought as well. So I think um, it's healthy for this correction to happen, kind of weeds out the bad players. But also the hype has helped bring in a lot of interest, which I think is good for the cryptocurrency, uh, econ- uh, sorry, cryptocurrency um, ecosystem as a whole. So, um, no, I'm not worried about cryptocurrency personally just because Bitcoin price is dropping, but I just think this needs to happen for, for people to, st- to stop worrying about price and just look forward to the future of cryptocurrencies. Well, I, I think that anyone who is uh, deeply invested in crypto and who has been invol- uh, involved in the scene feels similarly. You know, like they, they see that there's... A bunch of coins out there that really have no basis. Uh, at the same time, there are a number that have a really solid technical team behind them. And you, you know, I, I was uh, I was talking with uh, with some people just uh, at some meetups this week, and you can always tell who are the people who've been involved with uh, crypto project development teams because everyone will be asking them, you know, what should I invest in? And they always say, well, just, just do your own research. You know, you see the guys, you meet the people, you shake their hand and you can get a sense for if this is something that's uh, going to have a future or if this is something that's pure hype. Now, that said, there isn't a single crypto out there uh, that doesn't have some level of hype. I mean, that's how they're getting off the ground, but uh, uh but it's interesting, Neil. I, f- I feel like we've swapped roles. You know, you're you're, you're a lot more positive about the uh, <laughs> the future yeah, yeah, of, yeah. The, of the well, coins now. Well, I, I kind of feel the mask has has come off. Uh, I didn't feel that this uh, illusion that was being built around blockchain and cryptocurrencies was was he- a healthy one, and I felt that people really needed to realize that actually. It's uh, it's premature the hype and there's still a, a long way to go. I think the IOTA is is that the type of coin uh, IOTA or I, IOTA? I, I, IOTA, yeah, yeah. I think the the sort of security weakness that was identified there uh, last week. I think that was a big moment uh, in in the realization that look, guys, if you try to make this technology too quickly, if you don't do your due diligence, uh, you know, uh, every, all, all of these coins are effectively worth this you know we need to like people need to take the time to develop strong technology and getting um, caught up in the price doesn't do anyone any good no absolutely uh it, but you you mentioned the iota uh that iota ran into a a setback uh, maybe maybe not everyone has heard about this uh, this little bit of news um uh, I I, I want to make sure that the the news that I think you're talking about is the same one. Actually, uh, I read an article that uh, that the IOTA Foundation had written their own cryptocurrency. Uh, no, sorry, written their own cryptograph uh, cryptographic hashing function. Is that correct? So that's yeah. the same thing that we're thinking of. Yeah. yeah so essentially, you, no one. Uh, you shouldn't roll your own crypto. You should you should really when you're using a cryptographic technological algorithm. 
you should use one that other people have tested and put in years of testing and testing and making sure it's accurate. What uh, apparently what happened with IOTA was that it was identified they they wrote their own algorithm and uh, some people did some tests on it and they found what are called collisions. And uh, that means that you can put two different inputs into their hashing function. You get the same output, which is a big security hole. So that's been patched since then. But it really just goes to show you that this is um, this is more than just uh, hype about uh, about price, about projects. This uh, these are very technical uh, problems that require a lot of research and really. Uh, a, a lot of good attention to detail, very technical teams in order to implement. But I mean, I have a lot of confidence in the IOTA project, honestly. I, I met with uh, some of the guys at a meetup uh, just this week, and uh, it's it's definitely one of the more interesting projects. And I think we need to do a, a show uh, dedicated to the technology behind IOTA at some point. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I agree. Um, I think it's important to dig into it and let our listeners know more about it. But I'm I'm kind of gone the other way in terms of confidence in IOTA. It's like, I think, um, you know, people think it's all about tech and science, but, you know, really shows leadership is a big, big part of any of these cryptocurrencies and uh, in order for them to develop uh, in a sound fashion because someone had to make that call on the, the hash function. And, you know, so kind of creates the sense of doubt well if they made that mistake who else is making this mistake in terms of uh, cryptocurrencies so i think it was a great lesson and you know at it's a, you know, now's a good time to reflect on a lot of these cryptocurrencies and other, and other blockchain companies to really do their due diligence because some of them are just racing too quickly to to have an ico or whatever and you know they're missing out on these uh, little issues, or oh, sorry, big issues actually. So um, it's why I'm happy that the price is is falling because people will become less obsessed about it, and I think we'll uh, you know we'll end up having more robust or uh, more robust technology uh, going forward. Hmm. No, I think uh, I do agree with you. I think that this is uh, probably something that's going to uh, uh, to. to help the uh, the market and the industry in the long run because you're right that there are a lot of people who are investing in crypto who have absolutely no idea about, of the technologies behind it and uh and in an ideal world they won't have to but to be honest i don't think that the that technological reasons are the reason that we're seeing these price fall this week i mean oh, yeah, totally. uh, the bigger the biggest news that i that i've read has been number 1 china Yep. Uh, again, uh, striking again with the ban hammer, <laughs> and number two, uh, Jamie Dimon coming on uh, on the news and uh, saying you know, of J.P. Morgan there and saying, you know, oh, I wouldn't invest in Bitcoin. Anyone who does is an, is an idiot. And uh, I think those two things probably have an effect of scaring off maybe people that aren't as uh, familiar with the space. Yeah, well, I would say. Jamie Dimon's comments are were, was just adding fuel to the fire. If he had said it before it hit five thousand dollars, people would just laugh at him, and I think the price would have continued to climb. Um, I think it was because it was already going down because of the uh, the China ban. I think it just made it go down even quicker during that period of time. Uh, things seem to settle, but then again, this morning we see more news coming out because of exchanges. And uh, I think BTCC announced that they were closing not long after Jamie Diamond, which again added more fuel to the fire. So I think it's like a combination of things, but I I think people put too much emphasis on him and his comments. I think it's really all about China uh, because you have to remember they were getting very involved. They were developing a lot of technology. And if China's bringing in these bands, we could see the Chinese tech community lose interest in blockchain which in effect uh, could mean a lot of resources, a lot of investments would leave the blockchain space, which in turn could mean that a lot of these uh, potential investments won't reach uh, fruition like people think it would uh, in the future. Now, you may have a very good point there. I mean, I, I saw a few people uh, mentioning that Jamie Dimon's comments were very similar to Blockbuster saying, oh, people will def uh, definitely never want to order their uh, their movies by mail and uh, <laughs> or uh, 
maybe you know the record uh, the record company is saying oh people absolutely will want cds no one will ever stream music or <laughs> <laughs> but in, in maybe kodak <laughs> with their uh, who, but see, uh, who would ever want to replace film <laughs> exactly well you know they all do have a very valid point it's like i see the comments and i do laugh i i feel that they're premature in the sense that um that I, I wouldn't be surprised in 10 years time if JP Morgan and the likes are trading cryptocurrencies. But I think right now, today, I think he, he does have a point. Um, there is not enough, uh, I guess, data supporting the fact that we sh- it should be tra- treated as an asset like th- that being Bitcoin, because he was specifically talking about Bitcoin. But I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, JP Morgan is trading other cryptocurrencies that they deem uh, worthy of being treated as a security of some sort after regulation has come in that has uh, rubber stamped these type of assets. So um, it is easy to laugh at him now, but I think he has a point today. But I think in the future, I wouldn't be surprised if he were to reverse his position after some developments in favor of blockchain and cryptocurrencies. There was one thing that uh, question that's been in my mind since I heard his comments, and that was, I wonder if someone was in a powerful enough position, if they would be able to manipulate the price. And, you know, I don't, I'm not suggesting that that's what Jamie Dimon was doing or that JP Morgan would be doing that, but it did bring into mind what if someone wanted to? Could they? Could someone powerful enough uh, go up or go on a go on a national stage and go? This is absolute bullshit. The price falls to the floor. They buy it up, and then boom, it's up there. Um, you know, it, 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 this came to mind when I was reading the news about North Korea uh, saying, "Oh, we want to hack a bunch of Bitcoin wallets uh, in, in order to steal Bitcoin." I was like, "Yeah, good luck with that." But then I was thinking, what's easier? Hacking uh, an algorithm that everyone has, is incentivized to hack that no one has been able to, or finding a way to manipulate the price, buying up a bunch of Bitcoin and then letting the price pop back up when uh, uh, when the fake news has passed or whatever. Yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> it, I don't know. <laughs> it it is possible, but um, then it will all it would be about timing um, because. The thing is, some people were selling at 3,000, 4,000 because they wanted to get out before it really, it really did crash. So, um, and the thing is, when I was looking at the volumes, you did see like uh, quite sudden drops, but then people took it as, oh, it's cheap again. You know, there's a dip, you know, buy now because it's going to go up again in the next five, 10 days. So it, it it's very hard to tell um, because... Um, it's very hard to tell if someone can really move based on volume uh, because I think a lot of the news lately has caused fear and and it, you know and I think that's the real main factor if if uh, someone just decided to sell a bunch of Bitcoin at one time I, I don't think it would have had had the effect that we're seeing today because I think the Chinese news is is more stronger than someone buying a lot and then selling a lot uh you know to to make the move uh, to, to make the market move it also begs the question of exactly what um what level of uh of fear is in the community uh, because, I mean, you see people that are trying to set price floors. Oh, obviously, there's a psychological floor. You know, if it hits 3,000, if it hits uh, 3,500, 2,500, then that'll be the psychological floor. And boom, it'll be right back up again because people will go, okay, this is the lowest. Uh, we're going to buy it back up. Um, but I, it, it sort of makes me wonder, you know, how much of this is a sort of a hype Ponzi scheme? And would we be having this conversation if it was really a, uh, more of a currency and less of a <laughs> security? You know? Yeah. No, I think you have an interesting point. Like, if it really was a Ponzi scheme, it would go straight to zero. Um, but I think the community in itself uh, that are really behind Bitcoin, they, they see it as a, a bigger thing. And I'm sure a lot of people are holding more because they believe in the project. And some people have been holding, they've been holding a few years now that they've already made sig- significant returns, even if it drops to 1,500. So, you, you still have those guys in there that will uh, 
create a floor. You know, that floor could be 2,000, could be 1,500. We won't know. Uh, but, you know, I don't think the floor is 50. I, I don't think it's 100. I think if you look back uh, from January until March, it was hovering around 900, 1,000 before the whole ICO bubble began. I wouldn't be surprised if it's around about 1,000, 1,500 uh, that we see things settle. So if if it went to zero, yes, it's a Ponzi scheme, but I, I don't think uh, <laughs> I don't think it would go down that low. All right. Now let's end off with a special segment. I recorded these special segments back at the beginning of our podcast when we were first doing our research and I was still looking into different applications for blockchain, what other people are doing and what could potentially be done. I made a series of these short segments that we could uh, play on a, uh, and intersperse into the weekly episodes. And this one is one that I recorded on blockchain for voting. Time now for an analysis in chains special segment. Don't you wish you could vote online and be sure that the vote was secure? There's a reason that online polls and online voting hasn't really taken off as an official form of democracy. First of all, it's very limited in the number of people who, and the type of people who would participate in the online vote. So it's not a representative sample. And you're not always sure if someone has voted more than once. Is there fraud? With all of the talk in uh, the past year, about election security in Western democracies, about <clears throat> foreign interference with electoral systems. Having a solution does seem very appealing, especially one that would use the latest cutting edge blockchain technology to ensure that whatever vote you registered wasn't changed later, that there was transparency in the system and it can be used this way. This is an actually an excellent use case for blockchain. Let's take a look at how it will work in theory, what the strengths are and what the weaknesses are. So in theory, it's very straightforward. Someone, you need to make sure that someone who's voting has a verified ID. Once they are verified they have a chance to vote and then their vote would be registered uh, and you could also have an option that they could change their vote later up until the cutoff point and the way you would register their vote would be in uh, in the blockchain and then any changes later would be recorded but as long as the last change were at the time that the election is over was uh, the one that was counted, there should be no problem. The beauty of using a blockchain smart contract for this purpose is that code is transparent. Everyone can see that the code uh, does what it says it's going to do. And so instead of trusting an organization to oversee the election, you're trusting a code that everybody can see and has access to. So where can this go wrong? Well, as with most blockchain applications, the weaknesses are going to be whenever you call something off chain. And the weakness in this case is checking IDs. So in order to vote in a given election, you have to be sure that the person who is doing the vote is allowed to vote. And getting an ID doesn't happen on a blockchain. It happens when you meet a certification authority, someone who's authorized to give you that ID. And as uh, if the, the someone working at the authority is able to be bribed, then you can issue false IDs. If uh, someone wants to falsify who they are and uh, take someone else's ID, maybe someone who's passed away or someone else living in their house, um, you need a way of ensuring that doesn't happen, if, especially if you're voting remotely. So these are not insurmountable problems. Uh, you might use a blockchain system uh, alongside a traditional voting system, for example. Someone 
uh, someone wanting to uh, uh, to participate in an election might still have to go to a voting uh, a polling location and be checked in and have their ID checked by a certified person. Uh, and then the blockchain would ensure that the vote wasn't changed later or that if it was, it could be uh, uh, it would have to be at a certified location by uh, someone verifying that the person doing the voting and changing the vote is the actual person authorized to make that decision. So the blockchain in this case is about immutability of the vote after the fact, about making sure that the machines don't get hacked or that the, what was the, the word for the paper ballots back uh, many years ago? The, the hanging and dangling chads aren't, uh, aren't, aren't an issue in the election. What about for corporate votes? Boards of companies often have to meet and make official decisions. Boards of nonprofits and of other organizations have to make official decisions that are legally binding all the time. And these decisions often require people to be in the same room. With these type of votes, a blockchain voting system can actually be quite a useful tool because Verifying that a person is legitimately allowed to vote isn't as big a deal. People only even know the vote exists if they're part of the board usually. And this allows people to have official meetings without being in the same room, being able to Skype in or uh, otherwise telephone in, uh, and allows people in operating in a board position the freedom of being able to participate from wherever they are in the world. And so as a first step, we can expect that corporate voting uh, in, for corporate decisions is going to take off probably more quickly than for a democratic vote that has millions of people who are all registering in a much higher stakes game. I'm sure it will be interesting to see how this plays out going forward. Okay, one last thing before we wrap up, I just wanted to let you know, on the 29th of September, so the very end of September, last Friday, September, we're going to be airing a interview that I did with Sergei Nazarov, CEO of Smart Contract. So be sure to tune in. It's a, he's a really amazing guy with an amazing company. You're going to learn all about uh, the reason that we need middleware to communicate between blockchains and the outside world. As we wrap up, Neil... Uh, are we going to see the price rebound within the next couple of weeks, do you think? Um, yeah, it's totally natural. Uh, often markets have what's called a dead cat bounce, uh, where it kind of comes back to life and everyone thinks everything's back to normal before it drops down again. So, yeah, I, uh, I think there's going to be a sudden uplift, but then uh, it will continue to drop. Mm. Hold on to your hats and keep on hodling. All right. We'll see you guys on Monday. That's our show. Thanks for tuning in to Analysis and Chains with Nathan and Neil. Check us out at analysisandchains.com on iTunes, Podbean, and wherever else you listen to podcasts. Until next time, keep hashing.